Welcome back to uh, CMOS RF integrated circuits. Um, today is the 23rd lecture. We are going to talk about uh, continue our uh, work on the low noise amplifier design. So, what we were working on in the last class, we had, I was proposing the following. I was proposing that uh, let us have the MOSFET and the problem with the MOSFET is that the input is capacitive, but what we are going to do is we are going to degenerate the source of the MOSFET. Okay. And um, what I propose to show is that the GM of this particular cell if I apply V in over here, then the input impedance I can get is um, not necessarily capacitive. That is what I propose to show. There is going to be a resistive element here. So, first let us show that and then we are going to move on to the LNA design. So, I have the, uh, I need to find out the input impedance. So, I apply a voltage at the input and I need to compute what is the current going in. So, to do this I am going to replace the MOSFET with G m in shunt with R d s. Now, the R d s is between the source and ground. So, I am really going to put it in over here. Okay. Then in addition there is C G S there is C G D and uh, there is C source to body. C drain to body is relevant is irrelevant because both terminals are of C drain to body both terminals are at ground. Drain is at ground, body is at ground. So, it does not really matter. Right? So, this is what we were analyzing. Now, I am going to simplify this a little bit and uh, finally, this is what I have got. Okay. So, if this is z in and this is z in prime, then really z in is z in prime in shunt with C G D. So, let us just compute z in prime and later on we will figure out what z in is. Z in is just an additional capacitor C G D. All right. So, this is what we were working on in the previous class and this is my source terminal. This is where I have applied a voltage V and I want to measure the current I that is going in. And to do this, I need to find out what is the voltage at the source. Right? So, whatever is the voltage at the source, let me do a Kirchhoff's current law over there. So, V minus V s times j omega C G s is the current going in through the gate plus G m V G s is the current going in from the drain that should be equal to the current going out of the source which is V s by z. Right, 
and um, you put all the V s terms together. So, what you are going to get is j omega c g s plus g m on one side times v is equal to v s times 1 by z plus g m plus j omega c g s and this is going to further simplify and you will find out that v s ok, I do not need to do that. Right. Now, I is really this is I and uh, Z in prime is equal to V by I, which is equal to One by j omega c g s into one minus v s over v. Let me know if I am making any mistakes. V s by V is something that you have computed. So, you get z in prime equal to 1 by j omega c g s times 1 minus j omega c g s plus g m divided by 1 by z plus g m plus j omega c g s which further simplifies into 1 by 1 by z plus g m plus j omega c g s times j omega c g s times 1 by z. All right, and then you multiply numerator and denominator by z. So, you get 1 plus g m times z plus j omega c g s times z divided by j omega c g s, which simplifies to z plus z into g m by j omega c g s plus 1 by j omega c g s. All right. So, this is your z in prime and z in is this in addition to a capacitor in shunt C G D in shunt, which is not terribly difficult to find out if you know what this is. Right. Okay. So, what do you see over here? What if Z is an inductor? We started by saying that let Z be okay, let us say Z is a capacitor to start with. Or do you want Z to be a resistor? Right now, Z is a combination of CSB, RDS, and whatever is placed at the source. So, let us say Z is a resistor. So, Z can be a resistor, in which case you have got a resistive component over here, you have got a capacitive component over here and you have got a capacitive component over here and then you will have another capacitor and shunt with all of this fine. So, 
this is what happens when z is a resistor. We do not want z to be resistors because resistors generate noise. We are making a low noise amplifier. So, we would like to avoid all of these resistors. All right. So, then let us say z is a capacitor. If z is a capacitor, what have you got? You have got a capacitor over here plus what have you got over here? 1 by j omega times 1 by j omega. So, you have got 1 by minus right, this is what you have got, which means it is minus omega squared times this right. So, this is going to give you a negative resistive component, it is bad news. Negative resistance means there is some sort of positive feedback going on, something is a source of power over here. Strange things are going to happen, it will lead to instabilities, do not do this do not make z a capacitor. Okay. It, if you make z a capacitor, it is very likely that your design is going to zoom into instable in unstable behavior. Okay. So, the next option for us is z is an inductor, which is what I proposed. So, if z is an inductor, then this is an inductor. What is this? this is going to be a resistance, this is going to look like a resistor, it is beautiful. Okay. There is no resistance in the picture, but the input impedance is as if there is a resistor. So, this quantity if z is j omega l, then this particular quantity is going to be g m times L by C G S. All right. And now, it is just a, a simple matter to choose J omega L uh, to choose your L such that these quantities resonate with each other at the so, you want this to probably resonate with this at the chosen frequency, then you have got a pure resistance over there, right. They need not resonate actually, you just need a resistive component. In any case, you have got C G D in shunt with this, right. So, your final resistive component will be a different, will be altered by the value of C G D. Final capacitive component is also going to be different, reactive component is going to be different. And then you find out what these reactive components are, what the resistive component is and then you create your matching network to match to that. So, this is basically the going to be the strategy. I am going to have a MOSFET degenerated by an inductor. Okay. And um, this is going to generate some, this is going to behave like a GM cell. In front of the MOSFET, I will need a matching network. right and over here I have my source. So, typically this matching network will contain one inductor probably, actually one inductor should be able to do the job. Okay. I mean you have
this is your typical uh, LNA input, it is going to look like this. And uh, let us just look at what, what there is to it. So, looking in from this point, I have got j omega l s plus g m times l s by c g s, this is my resistance plus 1 by j omega c g s, that is what I have got looking into the gate. Now, question over here, we said that z is the parallel combination of R d s, C s b and the inductor. And now, I have just replaced z with just the inductor, what is going on? It is wrong right, you are right, it is wrong, but for an engineering uh, 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 approximation, you can just pick L, let us say L is 10 nano Henry, I will just give you some numbers to work with. Let us say inductor is 10 nano Henry, C s b is uh, 150 femtofarads and let us say R d s is uh, 2 kilo ohms and let us say we are talking about a frequency of uh, 10 giga radians per second. All right. So, at 10 giga radians per second, 10 nano Henry's is going to behave like um, 100 ohms, j times 100 ohms. So, j times 100 ohms in shunt with 2 kilo ohms is j times 100 ohms. What about 150 femtofarads? 150 femto times 10 giga, so 10 minus 15 times 10 to the 9 is 10 power minus 6. So, 1.5 milli siemens. So, you have got about uh, 700 minus j 700 ohms over here. So, minus j 700 ohms in shunt with plus j 100 ohms is, so if you put a large resistor in shunt with a small resistor, parallel combination is smaller than the small, is close to the small resistor. So, the small resistor is j times 100, so the parallel combination of all of these three is just the inductor, right. So, that is why I just picked as an engineering approximation, let us say that the inductor wins. What if the capacitor wins? If the capacitor is larger, then you have, if the capacitor dominates the story, then you have trouble, you are going to get unstable behavior. You do not want the capacitor to dominate. You want the inductor to dominate, so choose your inductor accordingly. All right. So, that is why as a first approximation, I have said that input impedance Z is just J omega L s. Right. So, this was a first order approximation that we did, I substantiated my approximation. Fine. Now, uh, you also have uh, C G D over here. Right. And you have to do the matching so, you have got an inductor in series with a capacitor is basically some reactive element. So, this entire thing is being modeled as
some reactance over there. And now you do series to parallel transformation. When you do series to parallel transformation, what happens to the resistor? The value of the resistor is going to change, it is going to go up or down by the q, it is going to go up by the quality factor right, of the component. And um, the value of the reactance is going to pretty much remain unchanged, value of the resistance is going to go up by q squared approximately. Fine. Then, so this is going to transform to this. You have done the series to parallel transformation. Then you are going to do the once more, you are going to lump all of these together and then again you are going to do a series to parallel transformation, I mean uh, parallel to series transformation, I am sorry, right. And finally, what you are going to get? will look something like this. Okay. Now, it is going to be your job to figure out the values of this inductor and this inductor that you started with. So, that at the end of the day you get matching. So, you have two degrees of freedom, you have to fix the load to be equal to R s that is number 1 and number 2 you have the frequency to work with at the chosen frequency you have to do the matching. So, you have to pick L g and L s accordingly. Now, of course, L g need not be an inductor it also potentially could have been a capacitor we do not know until you work it out all the way. Fine, is this good so far so good? All right. So, this is how my input is going to look like. Now, what about the load? The load also most probably is going to need output matching. What about the gain? How much gain are you going to get out of this? So, suppose you have done your output matching, how much gain do you expect? How do you find out the gain? Whenever you have source degeneration, source degeneration is a kind of feedback, right. So, the voltage at the gate is approximately equal to the voltage at the source in the small signal which means that the gain is basically going to be this load impedance divided by the degeneration impedance that is going to be your gain approximately. Am I right? Now, this kind of gain is no good, might not be good enough. So, what we do is, we would probably like a cascoded stage over here. Okay. So, 
So, what we probably like over here, what we would you would probably like over here is to have the load, the first load to be a low impedance node. So, this drain should be at a low impedance node. What else? Why else do you want the drain to be a low impedance node? Remember when we did our analysis, we assumed that the drain is a short. Okay. We assumed that the drain is a short and we did our analysis. If the drain was not a short, if the drain was the load, then your analysis also would change. Right? Life would not be so easy. All right. So, a low impedance over there is desirable. So, suppose I have a low impedance, yet the source of a MOSFET is a low impedance node. So, I am I'm, I would like to have a low impedance node over there. Now, all the current that comes out of the drain is therefore, going to come out through the source. Okay, so, the short circuit current all of the current is going to go in as opposed to going through the RDS. Right? You do not want the current to go through the RDS, you would rather have the current go through the load which is the source impedance. Then all of this current now can be transferred to a high impedance load which means that you are going to get the full gain of you can have a large impedance over there. All right, so, this is going to be my strategy. Uh, my strategy is basically going to be to have a cascoded device on the drain of the first MOSFET of the input MOSFET. All right, And then I am going to put a load at the drain of the second MOSFET. So, what kind of load do you want at the second MOSFET at the drain of the second MOSFET? You want a load which is matched. So, there is this impedance, you want the impedance looking into the node to be the same that is going to give you the maximum possible power transfer, maximum power transfer. All right. Now, what is the impedance looking downwards from the drain of M 2? what is the impedance at the frequency of interest. What is the impedance looking downwards from the drain of M 2? Okay, question uh, before, before we do this, what is the impedance looking in here? it is some sort of capacitor in series with R s. right? And that capacitor is hopefully going to be resonated out by L g. right? So, the impedance looking in there is the same as the impedance is the conjugate of the impedance looking the other way. Am I right? the impedance looking in to the gate from this particular point 
is the conjugate of the impedance looking this way, because if it is not then you have not done proper matching at the input. So, at the chosen frequency the impedance looking into the gate of the MOSFET is basically equal to R s minus j omega L g. Okay, because if it is not, then you have not done your matching. All right. So far so good, all right. So, as far as uh, computing the impedance looking here is concerned, that impedance should be equal to the conjugate of the impedance looking downwards. So, the next question is what is the impedance looking downwards from the M 2. So, when I look at M 2, um, the drain of M 2 has some capacitance to ground C drain to body ok. There is also C drain to gate alright. The source of M 2 has some capacitance to ground C G S and C S B. As far as M 1 is concerned, the drain of M 1 has capacitance to ground ok and um, the drain of uh, M 1 has capacitance to the gate. The source of M 1 has capacitance to gate and the source of M 1 has capacitance to ground which is already lumped into J omega L s right. So, these are all the different things. Now, when you look into a terminal from oh, all right uh, let me further make one more uh, approximation let us say that the uh, drain of M 1 is at a low impedance node. So, really the C gate to drain of M 1 is almost like a capacitor to ground. which is already taken care of in Z in 1 and so on and so forth. Okay. So, we are going to keep that out of the picture. All right. Now, oh, CGS is also taken into account, fine. So, what we have got here are two transistors.
So, this is what we have got all right and um, how do you find out uh, the impedance of this? You use one of your two formulae, your two favorite formulae. First of all, we need to know what is the impedance looking in over here. what is the impedance looking in over there? How do you do that? You remember one of your two formulae? Right. So, we are going to use um, that particular relationship to attempt to find out what is the impedance looking in. So, suppose this impedance is z, then can you find out the impedance looking in over here? It is easy, it is the same thing again, right? just that now it is z in shunt with a certain capacitor that you have to work with. All right. But before that let us find out what z is, is it really, is that formula really applicable? Because right now I have got something connected at the gate, the gate is not a short anymore. So, I have got something on the gate, let us say what I have got on the gate is z g. Okay. Let us say this is L, so I need to find out what is the impedance looking in from the drain. And um, how do you do this? So, I apply a voltage over here and I need to find out the current over here. Okay. So, if there is uh, some V g s, is there any connection between uh, is there any connection over here? because if there is, then there potentially could develop some V g s. Well, that C g s is really not very important, because I have approximated that that C g s is to ground, that particular node, the drain node is at a low impedance. So, I have really taken this out of the picture. So, there is no coupling between the drain and the gate this was to, to ground which is already lumped inside z g. Right? So, there is no coupling between gate and the drain which means that if you apply a voltage only on the, on the, uh, on the drain then nothing is really going to go through, there is not going to be any gate current. So, the current over here is 0 which further means that the voltage on the gate is going to be 0. All right, this is okay. So, if the voltage on the gate is equal to 0 or almost equal to 0, let us just rationalize that once more. So, what I am saying is that C G D I have lumped it inside z g, because if I do not, then my computation becomes very, very difficult. All right. Even this impedance computation becomes not so easy to work on. 
So, I have lumped C G D, I am an engineer, I like to do approximations. So, C G D is first of all a small capacitor. So, therefore, its contribution should be less. So, I have lumped the effect of C G D inside that Z G and there is no coupling between drain and gate. Right? So, there, therefore, there is no current on the gate, if there is no current on the gate, then the potential on the gate is going to be 0. If the potential on the gate is going to be 0, then we have got the old setup and once you have got the old setup, then you know you can work, work, work it out, your formula will be as expected. Is this okay? So, this is my logic and as a result what I am going to get is that this Z D is going to be approximately equal to G M 1 times R D S 1 times J omega L plus J omega L plus R D S 1. Now, this impedance is primarily an inductor, a huge inductor in series with a small resistor. All right. So, Z D is primarily an inductor. Further going, this inductor is going to be in shunt with a capacitor. Right, this inductor is going to be in shunt with a capacitor and um, therefore, that I mean hopefully that capacitance is not going to be terribly large, which means that it is still going to remain inductive, which means that the impedance looking into the drain of the second MOSFET is going to be primarily an inductor. So, the inductant the impedance looking in the final impedance looking into the circuit is going to be primarily an inductor. You can work out the numbers, once you have the numbers you can work out exactly what is what and you are going to get that that is primarily an inductor. What does that mean for us? What does that mean? That means that my load can be a capacitor which is terrific because I would like to drive a capacitor, I would the stage after the MOSFET is going to be the input of another gate, input of another gate is a capacitor, I love driving capacitors, I would like to drive capacitors, I mean I, I really like this, I really like the fact that the impedance looking in overall at the output is highly inductive because then I can drive a capacitor. Right, and um, you can work your way and find out exactly how much inductance you need to drive that particular capacitance. Right, and um, if you need lesser inductance, hopefully you'll need lesser inductance. You won't need so much. Then you need to put another inductor in shunt with this entire huge inductor and make it resonate with the load capacitor that you are planning to drive. So, this is the story alright. So, my final LNA design typically contains tuned LNA design typically contains three inductors. So, this is a typical tuned LNA design. Alright, this is a typical tuned LNA design 
all of these values need to be carefully chosen so that you get your input and output matching at your chosen frequency of interest right and um, uh, are there any noise generating components over here so we have worked on matching so both the input and the output need to match for maximum gain right so we have worked on that next thing gain we have worked on the gain this this gives me decent amount of gain because of the cascaded stage i do get a very decent amount of gain out of this all right so we have worked on both of these qualitatively right once you get into the design you have to actually sit and work with the actual numbers and then only you will be able to design the real uh, components uh, might require simulation because sometimes the numbers become too difficult to handle okay but we qualitatively understand the role played by each of these inductors the role played by each mosfet why what we have done is what we have done in this particular design the third thing the noise this is a low noise amplifier so i have to talk about the noise remember we have discarded our previous designs based on uh, noise performance so we had a couple of designs before this we had this we threw out through this out because of noise performance we had this because we threw it out because of noise performance so how does this play when it comes to noise what are the noise generating sources here inductors generate no noise wonderful you don't have to think about all of these inductors at all so the only noise generating sources over here are the channel of m2 the channel of m1 there might be some noise in the gate of m1 okay this is in addition to the channel noise this gate noise is coming because of the distributed resistance that the gate is the gate itself is made up of poly material which is distributed resistive element all right and there could be some gate noise of the second device as well okay so all of these elements will translate into noise okay so what's the story let's work one by one let's first look at what's most important to me okay i n 1 squared is in my mind going to be the most important let's see what the outcome of this is so this particular noise source is across the channel of the first mosfet so the way you analyze noise is uh, there there could be two possible ways first of all you have to null all the other noise sources all the other voltage sources all right so once you do that so i null that particular voltage source oh the source resistance of the voltage source has some noise right this is the source noise all right so when it comes to the noise figure computation this is just going to give me 1 plus something right 1 plus the total input referred noise divided by the total source noise okay uh 
I am sorry, total input referred noise divided by the total source noise is going to be the noise figure, noise factor. Uh, so, that is why that source noise is also important. All right. Now, this i n 1 squared, let us worry about it first. How are you going to work on it? So, there are two possible ways. Strategy number one is find out the noise that it generates at the output divided by the gain of the LNA and that will give you the input refer noise. Strategy number B is try to refer it back to how much voltage I need to try to find out how much voltage I need to apply at the gate to generate that particular noise on the channel. So, these are the two strategies. I am going to prefer the second strategy because the first one is way too complicated. So, what I am going to do is first we are going to null out all the other noise sources. And I am going to attempt to find out what is the voltage that I need to apply over here, what voltage can I apply over here such that I get so much current in the channel. This is the question, right. And uh, to answer this, the remaining the, the second MOSFET device L D, the load etcetera etcetera can be shunted out of the picture. So, what we have is something like this. So, let me apply a voltage over here. So, to generate I n 1, what is the voltage that I need to apply over there? That is basically the question and um, how are you going to do this? We need to know what is the input impedance looking here. We have already found out what is the input impedance looking there, right. We have already found that out. That particular input impedance is j omega l s plus g m times something like this all right that is the input impedance looking in over there. If you choose uh, if you choose g m to be something like 10 milli siemens l s to be 10 nano siemens 10 nano henry c g s is let us say 200 femtofarad. Then um, what is the middle component, resistive component? 10 milli Siemens times L s by C g s, L s by C g s is uh, 10 nano divided by 200 femto. So, So, I get about 50 kilo ohms, uh, I am sorry 50 kilo times 10 milli. So, I get about 500 ohms over there. 
j omega l s was j times uh, how much I have forgotten did I rub it off no j times 100 and 1 by j omega c g s is going to be something much much larger all right. So, it is going to be capacitive and there is going to be a resistive element over there. Uh, I think uh, we are running out of time over here, our 1 hour slot is almost over, but really uh, what we are going to take over in the next class is how we are going to compute I n 1. I am sorry, uh, what is V n 1 such that I get I n 1? And um, then again we have to square it mean squared noise, we need a certain mean squared noise. So, what is what should be the mean squared noise voltage that I need to apply at the input right. So, we are going to continue this computation in the next class. Uh, that is when you are really going to see what is the benefit of having this kind of a structure, the what the role what is the role of the inductor over there. So, that is also going to be something important that we are going to demonstrate with this computation. Uh, with this note, on this note I am going to stop and um, uh, we are going to continue from here in the next class. Thanks. Thank you.